magic, said Tom, as he settled on the grass in the show tent. Around him, the crowd waited impatiently for something to happen. It's not real, hissed Pete. It's only tricks. Before breakfast. Where's Papa going with that axe? said Fern to her mother as they were setting the table for breakfast. Out to the hog house, replied Mrs. Arabelle. Some pigs were born last night. I don't see why you need an axe, continued Fern, who was only eight. Well, said her mother, one of the pigs is a runt. It's very small and weak, and it will never mount to anything, so your father has decided to do away with it. Oh, the places you will go by Dr. Zeus. You have brains on your head, you have feet in your shoes. You can steer yourself any direction you choose. You're on your own and you know what you know, and you are the kids who decide where to go. You'll look up and down streets, look them over with care. About some you'll say, I don't choose to go there. With your head full of brains and your shoes full of feet, you're too smart to go down any not so good street. There were once three children called Joe, Beth and Franny. All their lives they had lived in the town, but now their father had a job in the country. So they were all to leave as soon as they possibly could. What fun to be in the country, said Joe. I shall learn all about animals and birds. In two strides, the Trunchbull was beside him. And by some amazing gymnastic trick, it may have been judo or karate. She flipped the back of Wilfred's legs with one of her feet so that the boy shot up off the ground and turned a somersault. She caught him by an ankle and held him dangling upside down like a plucked chicken in a window shop. Only once a year on his birthday did Charlie Bucket ever get to taste a bit of chocolate. The whole family saved up their money for that special occasion. And when the great day arrived, Charlie was always presented with one small chocolate bar to eat all by himself. And each time he received it on those marvellous birthday mornings, he would place it carefully in a small wooden box that he owned. Hat in the Hat by Dr Seuss. But our fish said, no, no, make that cat go away. Tell that cat in the act you do not want to play. He should not be here. He should not be about. He should not be here when your mother is out. Now, now, have no fear. Have no fear, said the cat. My tricks are not black bad, said the cat in the hat. Why? Was Hall. You don't have to believe this story. My uncle told it long ago, but my uncle didn't always tell the truth, so make up your own mind. In 1920, Rose Hall, Great House, the famous haunted Great House overlooking the Caribbean Sea on the north coast of Jamaica, lay in ruins. No one had lived there for over 50 years. It stood alone on the hill, rising from the green cane fields. Harry awoke as though the sudden darkness was an alarm. Hastily straightened his glasses and unsticking his cheek from the glass, he pressed his nose against the window and stared and squinted down at the pavement. A tall figure in a long, billowing cloak was walking up the garden path. Pop was the baby barn owl and he lived with his mummy and daddy 
at the top of a very tall tree in the field. Clop was fat and fluffy. He had a beautiful heart-shaped ruff. He had enormous round eyes. He had very knackety knees. In fact, he was exactly the same as every baby barn owl that had ever been, except for one thing. Kind people, it made it sad that they had no children. If only we had a little boy, sighed the old woman. I know, she said one day, I could make a boy out of gingerbread. Dinosaurs were all wiped out a long way back in history. No one knows quite how or why. Now this will solve the mystery. It all began when cavemen felt embarrassed in the nude. So someone dreamt up underpants to stop them looking rude. The dinosaurs roamed everywhere, all teeth and huge long necks. But scariest and meanest was Tyrannosaurus Rex. Today, October 27, 1984. Claire is 13, Henry is 43. Claire, I wake up suddenly. There was a noise. Someone called my name. It sounded like Henry. I sit up in bed listening. I hear the wind and crows calling. But what if it was Henry? I jump out of bed and I run. With no shoes, I run downstairs, out of the back door and into the meadow. Mr. Stink by David Williams. Mr. Stink stank. He also stunk. And if it is correct English to say he stinked, then he stinked as well. He was the stinkiest, the stinky stinker who ever lived. A stink is the worst type of smell. A stink is worse than a stench. And a stench is worse than a pong. And a pong is worse than a whiff. My mind was paralysed by the dreadful shape which had sprung out upon us from the shadows of the fog. A hound it was, an enormous coal black hound but not such a hound as mortal eyes had ever seen. Fire burst from its open mouth. Its hackles and dewlip were outlined in flickering flame. Never in the delirious dream of a disordered brain could anything more savage, more appalling, more hellish be conceived than that dark form and savage face which broke out upon us out of the wall of fog. And listen well, my friends, and I will tell you a tale that has been told for a thousand years and more. It may be an old story, yet, as you will discover, it troubles and terrifies us now as much as ever it did and up to our ancestors, for we still fear the evil that stalks out there in the darkness and beyond. We know that each of us in our time, in our way, in our own way, must confront our fears and grapple with this monster of the night who given a chance, would invade our homes and even our hearts if he could. Early one morning as we were beginning our day's play in the backyard, Jem and I heard something next door in Miss Rachel Hallford's collard patch. We went to the wire fence to see if there was a puppy. Miss Rachel's rat terrier was expecting. Instead, we found someone sitting looking at us. Sitting down, he wasn't much higher than the collards. We stared at him until he spoke. Hey, hey yourself, said Jem pleasantly. I'm Charles Baker Harris, he said. I can read. So what, I said. I just thought you'd like to know I can read. You got anything that needs reading, I can do it. I'm climbing to bed. It takes me about five seconds to realise I'll never fall asleep. And I need to sleep desperately, because in the arena, every moment I give in to fatigue will be an invitation to death. It's no good. One hour, two, three pass, and my eyelids refuse to get heavy. 
I can't stop trying to imagine exactly what terrain I'll be thrown into. Desert, swamp, a frigid wasteland. Above all, I'm hoping for trees, which may afford me some means of concealment and food and shelter. I know I'm not an ordinary 10 year old kid. I mean, sure, I do ordinary things. I eat ice cream, I ride my bike, I play ball, I have an Xbox. Stuff like that makes me ordinary, I guess. And I feel ordinary inside. But I know ordinary kids don't make other ordinary kids run away screaming in playgrounds. I know ordinary kids don't get stared at wherever they go. If Please look after this bear. Mr and Mrs Brown first met Paddington on a railway platform. In fact, that was how he came to have such an unusual name for a bear, for Paddington was the name of the station. The Browns were there to meet their daughter Judy, who was coming home from summer for the holidays. It was a warm summer day and the station was crowded with people on their way to the seaside. This is Stanley. Stanley looks like an ordinary little boy, but his mum thinks he's a monkey. In fact, she calls him a cheeky monkey. A lazy toad, a greedy pig, a buzzy bee, a mucky pup, or a clumsy hippo. The badger had been doing what badgers do best, digging. He'd had a lovely day, and as usual, when he'd had a lovely day, he was filthy dirty. I'm very sorry, said Percy the park keeper, but you can't come to tea like that. The badger looked disappointed. You'll just have to have a bath, said Percy. Stanley knows everything there is to know about monkeys and apes. They have lots of hair, unlike Stanley. They usually walk on all fours, unlike Stanley. They are great climbers, unlike Stanley. They also have smaller brains. Stanley thinks this sounds more like Lionel. I was walking down the road and I saw a donkey. Hee-haw! He only had three legs. He was a wonky donkey. I was walking down the road and I saw a donkey. Hee-haw! He only had three legs and one eye. He was a winky wonky donkey. such nonsense. Mr Dursley was the director of a firm called Drummond which made drill bits. He was a big beefy man with hardly any neck, although he did have a very large moustache. Mrs Dursley was thin and blonde and had nearly twice the usual amount of neck which came in very useful as she spent so much of her time craning over garden fences sp spying on the neck. One fat, one short, one lean. Those horrible crooks, so different in looks, were nonetheless equally mean. Find one who spurs in the stories of old. He was face the front, David Briggs. What have you been told? With a shield on his arm and a lance in his. Hey, is that a ball I can see? Put it away. 